This is such a beautiful moment. The gospel reading leaves us with the image of the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit united as one. This is an epiphany, a sudden realization of the Trinity three in one. Jesus emerging from the waters of baptism, the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and God's voice speaking from heaven. We call God Father, Mother, Parent, the Heavenly, the Creator. That God person is invisible to human eyes. At Jesus' baptism, God manifests as voice from heaven. At other times, as pillars of clouds or fire. No human being has seen God's face, and yet, in the blessing we share at the end of every service, the blessing God gave Moses and Aaron to use in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, we say, the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Therefore, we believe even if God is invisible to us, God has a face, and God turns his face to us in blessing. The second God person is the Son, a human being, a man, visible, touchable, normal, just like you and me, but not really, because fully human and fully God at the same time, and endowed with the powers of salvation which you and I clearly lack. The Athanasian Creed, most likely from the 5th century, we don't know for sure. And we don't usually recite it during church service because of its length and complexity. But it describes this mystery passionately and in detail. So bear with me, please, as I recite. That we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to God's self. He is one, certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. I cited this part of the Athanasian Creed in detail because it shows how important the hypostatic union, the unity of Jesus' godly and human nature was to our forefathers and mothers. Take note of the impeccable logic and poetry in which this awesome mystery is described. So far, we have talked about the invisible creator God, the visible God in Christ, and now we will turn to the Holy Spirit, the third God person of the Trinity. At Jesus' baptism, the Spirit is compared to a dove, at Pentecost, it is compared to flames. The word for spirit in Greek and Hebrew translates as wind. In fact, the very first action of God in Genesis chapter 1 is making wind. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Just as Jesus, cosmic Jesus, 
The Spirit was with God from the very beginning and will be with God in all eternity. Proverbs 8 of the Hebrew Bible introduces an interesting figure in this context. It is written from the perspective of wisdom, Lady Wisdom, who is named as God's co-creator. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, says Lady Wisdom. Even though this passage tells us that wisdom was created by God, and we believe that Jesus, as well as the Holy Spirit, have always been part of the godly trinity, Lady Wisdom oftentimes is connected with Jesus, who in his cosmic nature includes all genders, just as God does. She can also be seen as an expression of the Holy Spirit, who is in the Gospel of John described as an advocate and a teacher, therefore a person of wisdom. The Trinity unites God in three persons, but God is much more than that. We know God by what God does much more than by who God is. We sometimes call the persons of the Trinity the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. Naming what God does in the world and for humanity, God the parent creates us and everything around us, God in human nature redeems us from sin and death, and God as spirit fills us with the strength, courage, ability, and inspiration to follow the path of discipleship. But of course, there are even more ways in which we can describe how God relates to us. God is our protector. Psalm 31 famously names God as the one we seek refuge with. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Another beautiful image which captures the protection and comfort we find in God is the image of Jesus as mother hen who protects her chickens. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. A similar image is that of God as a shepherd. Psalm 23 uses this image in respect to God who guides and comforts the believer in difficult times. In the Gospel of John, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And in the parable of the lost sheep, we are assured that God will always loyally look out for us, even if we have lost our ways. In a similar parable, God is compared with a woman who searches for her lost coin. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God also nourishes us. There are a variety of Bible passages in the book of Prophets which describe God as a mother, a loving, comforting, nursing mother. God says in Hosea, Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, I who took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. 
I bent down to them and fed them. In Isaiah, we can read, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses the image of a vine and its branches to describe the nourishing relationship between himself and his disciples. This image is oftentimes associated with the tree of life, which we can read about in Genesis chapter 2, a variety of Proverbs, and the book of Revelation. In art history, we can find the cross on which Jesus dies merged together with the tree of life, producing an amazing image of Jesus' death and resurrection and their meaning for us at the same time. You can see a tree of life icon at the cover of today's bulletin. There are, of course, many more images of God in Holy Scripture and Christian history. There's no end to ways how we can describe God and what God does for and means to us. Sometimes these many possibilities scare us. We might have gotten used to one particular image of God and feel that other images threaten the one we cherish. However, God is far beyond human imagination and there is room for many, many ways of imagining God. All of us are invited to widen our horizon and deepen our understanding of God by creating and reflecting on such images. These words and symbols rich in meaning help us to build and strengthen our faith. Some of them are well known, like the rite of baptism and its symbol of the Holy Spirit in form of a dove. Others are less well known, like the images of God as mother, or the Christological meaning of the symbol of the tree of life. All of them enrich us. More are to be discovered in our journey of faith. A journey which reveals God's grace and love, care and concern for us, every day anew. Amen.